Kara Shalom. Welcome to the Bible Journey. We are in Season 1, Episode 3 today, and we are going to talk about Genesis 3. I will read the whole chapter, but we are only going to discuss verses 1 to 6 after the reading. Before we dive deeper into this chapter, I want to make something clear. I believe in the absolute truth of the Word of God. The Church of Christ is in trouble nowadays because Christians are conforming more and more to the world standard instead of adhering to the standard of God. We are becoming increasingly afraid to speak up when it comes to what is right or wrong according to Scripture. If we compromise on the Word of God, if we have a view that only part of God's Word is true, then we can stop right here. Because then the whole of Genesis 1 to 11, and in fact the whole Bible, will only be another myth from the annals of a pantheon of gods. If you don't believe in the actual creation account of Genesis 1 to 11, then at which part of the Bible will you start believing? In Exodus, where God parted the Red Sea? In Joshua, where the sun stood still. What about Samson? How ridiculous to think that he had the strength to single-handedly bring down the temple of Dagon. Or will you start believing when you get to the resurrection of Christ? All of these are unbelievable feats from a worldly point of view. But if you can believe that God created the universe and everything in it, you can believe that Christ died and rose again to redeem you of your sin. So decide whom you will follow, God or the world. You cannot serve two masters. So let's read Genesis 3. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. Then the Lord God asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. 
and I will cause hostility between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. And to the man he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Then the man, Adam, named his wife Eve, because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Then the Lord God said, Look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. In this discussion, I will try to explain verses 1 to 6. There are a lot of interesting things happening in these six verses. Let's meet the cast. Here we have the serpent or snake. The general consensus is that the snake was possessed by Satan. I will elaborate on that a little bit later. Then we have the woman, played by Eve. She will receive her name at the end of chapter 3. And we have the man, Adam. What do we know about them? The Bible tells us that the snake was more crafty or the shrewdest of any of the animals God has made. From verse 1, we also see that he twists God's words in order to deceive and manipulate the woman. He makes God out to be a liar and not good and not trustworthy. And the woman? She's amiable and unafraid. She has no problem talking to a snake. She's also compromising. And then there's the man. He was made first. He already has a relationship with God. He received God's word directly and yet here he's passive. He does nothing to stop the woman from sinning. He does not rise to the role of leader of the house. So the stage is set and it all went downhill from here. So why did the snake even start a conversation with the woman? Well, it's generally agreed that Satan was behind the whole drama. Was he jealous of God's creation? Possibly. We learn from Ezekiel 28 that he was the most beautiful angel, but he rebelled against God and was cast out of heaven. He was prideful. He wanted to be like God. Now God had made man and he proclaimed that his creation was very good. And suddenly Satan is definitely not the brightest star in the universe anymore. He wants to destroy God's credibility and ultimately his creation. Why wasn't the woman afraid of the snake? In Genesis 1 verse 24 to 26, the Bible says that God made all creatures and gave man dominion over them. 
Man lived in harmony with the creatures of the earth. No need to fear predators and other ferocious animals, as it seemed that at the time all animals and creatures were herbivores. God says in Genesis 1 verse 30 that he gives them every green plant as food. I'm glad I didn't live in that time, as all and sundry were vegetarians. There's no indication that any of the creatures ate meat at all. So she didn't have any reason to fear the snake. Could it talk audibly? I don't dare to speculate, but since they had this conversation, it might be possible. Then again, the man was with her and he apparently didn't hear the serpent or speak to him as he didn't move to put an end to the whole fiasco. So maybe it wasn't an audible conversation. It doesn't make any difference to the outcome though. She allowed the snake to draw her into a debate about what God did and didn't say. And in the end, she compromised on what she knew to be true. And now we get to the man. Here he is with his wife and yet he does nothing. He remains a passive observer. He doesn't warn her to obey God's word. He doesn't stop her from eating the fruit. In fact, he sins with her. Why? Again, there are lots of speculation as to why he did this. Maybe he did hear the serpent's question and started analyzing the validity of the veiled accusation in the question. And before you know it, he was done in. Now let's look at verse 1 again. Now the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? He poses a question, but it's more of a taunt than an actual question. He manipulates the woman into questioning what she heard from God. Is what she heard really true? He steers her into distrust by asking whether they could eat from any tree. So here we have the word really and the word any. These two words bring the woman to a point where she doubts what she has actually heard from God. How do we know that she doubts? We'll see the outcome in verse 6. In verses 2 and 3, she responds by saying that they could eat, but not from the tree in the middle of the garden. Then she adds, you must not touch it or you will die. God never said anything about touching it. Is she trying to convince herself? Did the man tell her she mustn't touch it to make sure that she obeys? We don't know. But by adding to the word of God, she has placed herself in a precarious position. She has started to change what God said and what he meant. The groundwork was laid. Now Satan could step in. He says in verse 4, You will not certainly die. Some translations say surely. You will not surely die. So with this one word, he removes the threat of death from her mind. He fuels her doubts. In verse 5, he then adds, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. He creates in her a desire to be more than what she is, to be wiser, to know more, to become more. In verse 6, the wheels come off. She's convinced and she reaches out and takes some of the fruit. Three things work together here. She saw the fruit was good and pleasing to the eye and that it was desirable for gaining wisdom. 
It seems that Satan is attacking us from three fronts. By what we desire in our minds and bodies, by what we see, and through our pride. Pride and vanity are Satan's most powerful weapons. It isn't wrong to be proud of your child's accomplishments or to be proud when you have reached a goal. It is wrong when that pride makes you treat others as inferior to you or when it makes you sin in other ways. Now here in the second half of verse 6, we get to the crux of the story so far. Ever since I was a kid, I heard in Sunday school and in church later on that it was all Eve's fault. Well now, it seems to me that if I read the exact words here and if I understand them as they are written, the man was with her when she ate and he did nothing to stop her. Adam sinned willfully. He disobeyed well knowing what he was doing. He had a choice. This is implied by the phrase in Genesis 2 verse 16 and 17. God said that he was free to eat from any tree except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He chose to eat even though God forbade him to do so. I mean there were tons of trees that they could eat from why eat from the one that they were not allowed to eat? Isn't that so typical of human nature now? We have so much good to choose from, yet we easily choose what is bad for us. The man exercised his free will without considering the consequences and thus disaster came crashing down on the human race. Now this brings me full circle to my opening statement. If you reject the account that the man and woman sinned in Genesis 3, then there's no explanation for the subsequent delinquency of man and therefore no option of redemption, which renders the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ obsolete. Why do so many people reject the Genesis account? People don't want to believe that they are held accountable for their behavior and their thoughts. They don't want to follow God's standards because it makes them responsible to Him. Rejecting the account of Adam's sin means there's no violation of God's command. So if there's no cause to accept that something was done wrong, then we are free to do whatever we want without the fear of any consequences. Basically, we are then saying no Adam, no sin, no salvation and therefore no need for God. Choose today whom you will believe, the world or God. You cannot serve two masters. In the next episode, we will have a look at the rest of this chapter. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to post them in the comments below. I hope to see you soon. Vaya con Dios.